The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Scott Shemwell, and thank you for attending this webinar titled Attaining and Sustaining Operational Excellence, where we will build a business case. Uh, we will keep this under an hour, and we have time for questions at the end, and I'm sure most of you know that there's a chat box that you can put your questions in at the lower right-hand corner. So once again, thank you very much for your time today, and uh, hopefully you'll find this of value. Before we start, <clears throat> just a little brief um, introduction to my company, the Rapid Response Institute, and myself. The Rapid Response Institute has been around for several years under different names. It's a management consulting company, and we really help our clients focus on areas of uncertainty and capitalize on organizational agility, resiliency, and sustainability. My background is largely upstream oil and gas from the energy services perspective. Uh, I was a senior executive at Halliburton, later with Oracle. I was early in, had early involvement with the digital oil field of the future, which this is an extension of, and been involved in technology sales to the oil and gas industry for over 30 years. Um, by way of disclaimer, information we're presenting today uh, does contain some third-party information uh, and uh, leave it to you to make the judgments on the value of that information. All third-party information is cited and you will be provided with a copy of this document at the end, both in the form of the recording and the slides themselves, and you can look at the information yourself. For those of you <clears throat> that are not in the United States, and we do have some folks from Australia with us today, <laughs> The material you see is largely has a United States focus, but most of the processes, the safety issues, and even the regulations are very similar on a global basis. So to start with today, we'll talk a little bit about what is operational excellence. If you Google it, you'll find quite a bit of information on it, but often doesn't get adequately defined. We'll look at the characteristics of the operational excellence, how to attain it, what happens if you don't, a uh, brief value proposition. We'll show some of the technology that we have developed to help our clients do this. And finally, with any transition like this, there's a change management process, and we'll summarize this with some final thoughts. As part of the technology, I'll show you a brief overview of our Aorus 360 platform. So let's start by defining operational excellence. This definition comes from the Society of Petroleum Engineers. And it's a methodology to help organizations grow and sustain operational standards in today's environment, which includes government regulations, consumer requirements, communities, and NGO or non-government organization expectations. Uh, I think, as most of you know, the oil and gas industry, the energy industry in general, is under a lot of pressure to be cleaner from an environmental perspective and be safer. Uh, and I think that all of those are attainable. And part of the operational excellence issue. So what are the criteria for operational excellence? If we've defined it, how do we get there? This slide is taken from Bain, and this is cited as well. Um, the six criteria that are required to attain operational excellence. Top quartal asset performance. When we talk about assets, we're talking about the balance sheet of an organization. Those revenue producing assets, whether it's uh, reserves for an operator, a fleet of ships, a fleet of trucks. <clears throat> You've got to be in the top quartal of your environment. When we say immaculate reputation, you've got to be the gold standards. We all know companies that when they come to mind, they're the gold standards, the, the, the way we want to be. We also know organizations, when we hear their name, we think they're not necessarily at the top of their game. Distinctive capabilities are competitive advantage. And part, when we say capabilities, we're not just inside the firewall of the organization, but the entire supply chain or the ecosystem that the organization has. <clears throat> we have to have a high performance uh, culture. You've probably at this point heard about high reliability and the need to operate at the top of our game. The culture of the organization and the culture of the suppliers as part of that ecosystem has to be one of high performance. <clears throat> Goes without saying. <clears throat> Excuse me world-class health and safety systems. Uh, safety, there's a safety dividend, not only uh, the reduction in unplanned downtime, 
but the legal issues with um, injury and loss of life, regulatory issues, and even, even losing the license to operate. Best in class processes and systems. Now, those of you that are in information technology field, we say systems, IT systems are what come to mind quickly. But this is processes and management systems as well. The IT systems support best in class processes and management systems. Um, <clears throat> without these six criteria, you really can't say that you've obtained operational excellence. So not all of us are at that stage. This matrix is also from <clears throat> the Bain Company. It's in the same paper. And as you see, there are four different <clears throat> quadrants, all the way from best in class leading uh, to something where we've really got to do something about it. Underperforming, and we've all been in an organization where one individual or one small group of individuals is carrying the water and doing all the heavy lifting and the organization really does not come to, to bear on it. You also see little uh, different colored uh, ovals for the different types of assets. So if you got an oil field asset in um, Australia, one in the Gulf of Mexico and one in the UK, there's three different assets. And not all processes with all assets in any organization, particularly a large one, or one that's undergone some merger and acquisition recently, are going to have um, all assets performing in that best of class. Not that they shouldn't, but you do have some that you've really got to fix, do something about it, some underperformers that you can fix, and then the unsustainable ones where you've got a few people trying to get there and the organization by and large does not really care. So again, this is all taken, these last two slides were taken from a Bain and Company presentation, which is cited. I think if you're interested in it, you'll find some additional information. It's quite interesting. <clears throat> so what's the value? Uh, we talked about operational excellence as a way of doing business. But what do we get for that? Uh, I'm going to quote two McKinsey papers. Uh, this one uh, I like quite a bit. It says world-class operational execution can add up to 30% of the asset base. Well, that's your balance sheet again. And balance sheet uh, translates to stock price. So <clears throat> in the energy sector, we've had a bunch of layoffs. We currently have mergers and acquisitions underway. We've stacked equipment. We have cut everywhere we can, travel, uh, cut costs. But the only place left is in operations, in my opinion. You can continue to cut costs and you shouldn't waste money. I'm not suggesting that you can't have a continuous improvement process there. But if you look at 30% of your balance sheet uh, as the opportunity to increase the value of that company by that much, that's a significant number. So to put a few actual numbers on that, a second McKinsey paper uh, talking about upstream, 80% of cost in a project are time issues. How many of us have been involved in a project that's over budget and over, over, over delivery time uh, and it's just wasted? So 80% of those costs are time issues. Those are things that can be managed. Those are things that can be uh, uh, driven down much, much lower than that. <clears throat> 50 to 75% are engineering productivity constraints. Um, processes that are broken, last minute change orders, I was on a project several years ago. We hadn't even finished drinking the champagne from signing the documents when the change orders started. So clearly the scope of work and delivery was not that well documented. So these are areas where we can see significant and in many cases immediate impact on the organization by developing a world-class operational excellence model for our organizations. So let's talk a little bit about the risk. And what are the issues if you don't? Well, safety is the first one that comes to mind. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about safety in the next few slides in a little bit more detail, perhaps a slightly different way than many of you heard before. Uh, competitive landscape. If your competitors are working towards operational excellence and you're not as aggressive about it in your organization, they are likely to obtain competitive advantage on you loss of business opportunities. I think all of us know of companies that have been precluded from bidding on projects because the operator doesn't feel like their, particularly their safety uh, track record is, is good enough. And so if you can't bid on projects or you're the operator and you lose your permit to operate, uh, those can be catastrophic. 
And as I mentioned, the impact on the stock price, if you can extract anywhere near 30% of the value of your assets out of your organization, that should translate into better earnings per share. So there's a lot of reasons to go down this path towards operational excellence. And there's almost no reason, in my opinion, not to. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about systemic risk management. I think we're all familiar with occupational safety, hard hats, uh, gloves, steel-toed shoes, uh, those kinds of things that are OSHA-like and the kinds of things that we all should do. Um, no argument there. But there's a different approach to this as well. There's a systemic approach, which as you see at the very top here, is the human machine, the process and environmental interface. It's a holistic approach uh, towards looking at systemic safety and systemic risk management. Uh, it is appropriate for complex systems, such as you see the space shuttle there, or offshore facilities, pipelines, refineries, et cetera. It's an approach that takes into consideration uh, data from real-time systems or smart equipment. I think we now call this the Internet of Things. Uh, appropriate human training and human factors has become a big word in this industry, uh, largely coming from aerospace, where we're looking not just at ergonomics, but how the human actually interfaces with the technology. Uh, we all are incented by various um, behaviors and reward systems for doing things that one way or the other, and the, the behavioral systems need to be aligned so that everything comes together from a systemic uh, risk management approach. Another way to look at this <clears throat> is the human systems integration issue. Uh, this is a fairly recent term uh, from what I understand but it speaks to the issue of how the human beings, the teams, um, integrate themselves with the various engineering and knowledge systems that they need to do their jobs. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about an operations management system. Uh, you probably all have heard the word standard operating procedures, been around for quite some time. Uh, there's a transition underway some organizations are further along than others uh, towards an operations management system. Uh, this is an actual uh, slide taken from the website of one of the large oil and gas operators. Uh, we did some research with Penwell several years ago on operations management systems to understand what direction the, in the in industry was headed. And most of them are fairly similar. Um, Chevron calls theirs operations excellence management system. Um, operation excellence management system <clears throat> and there's a lot of information on theirs on their website. Uh, this one, this is taken from, from a different organization in Chevron. If you look at the eight issues, leadership is first, organization, risk management, process and procedure, management of the assets, optimization of those assets, privilege to operate, uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute, and of course results. If you can't measure it, how can you manage it? Uh, there's some arguments that uh, not everything is measurable, but for the most part, we all have KPIs, critical success factors for organizations, and if we can't get some sort of return on the data from the activity, then how can we improve it? In terms of the privilege to operate, um, the U.S. government is getting very aggressive about safety in federal waters through BESI, and they have suspended the right to operate of organizations. Well, if you can't operate, that's your revenue stream. Uh, you'll be out of business pretty quickly. But leadership, of course, is, is job one. Everything starts from the top, and not just from the office of the CEO, but from the, the shift supervisor, the team leader. Leadership is across the board and deep into the organization and across the supply chain ecosystem as well. Uh, we talked a little bit about risk management, and we're going to talk some more about processes and how to drive those. But this is a typical operations management system. If you haven't heard this term, uh, you will. And this way most organizations are running their, their business these days, and they expect their suppliers <coughs> to participate in this as well. And we'll talk about that in just a second. When we talk about an operations management system, there's a lot of words being tossed around. Uh, you'll see websites. Uh, if you go out to look at most large organizations, they will have something 
about their operations management system on their website. And if you read it, it reads like a policy, which indeed it is. Um, and probably it's not appropriate to go deeper than that on a public website. But it's more than just a website. It's more than just a policy. You see a lot of checklists. Uh, some of that's coming out of the aerospace. We have done some checklists. In fact, um, several years ago, we put together a really nice checklist. We quickly discovered no one in the field would use it because what we were asking them to do is do the checklist on top of their day job. And where we are today with the um, situation in this industry, people don't need any more to do. They're already strapped pretty tight. So if you, ask, if you say, okay, on top of doing your job, fill out this form, the likelihood is it's not going to be filled out all that well, if at all. This also has to work across the supply chain. It doesn't do any good for the operator or the large engineering company to have a world-class operations management system if their suppliers don't. Uh, there's a lot of regulations, a lot of standards. Um, these need to be baked into the workflow. If you're asking someone to do their job, and oh, by the way, make sure you're in compliance with this regulation, that's going to be a real challenge. So what we've done is we've built a system that starts with policy, builds on industry standards, the skills, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that individuals must have, tools, which are everything from a wrench to a piece of software. Upon this core foundation, the processes break down all the way down to the subtask. Now you see in the middle here the term relationship. Most of you know that 90% of the field personnel are contractors. The oil and gas companies do not do the actual work in many cases. They have contractors and subcontractors and subcontractors do the work. So you see over here in this diagram that there's a lot of different players out there, different companies, partners on projects, uh, competitors from a standpoint of the various uh, suppliers will work on the same project together doing different things. So the approach to risk management, as I mentioned, can no longer be high, low, medium, or high, medium, and low, um, a simplified version, if, okay, we, it has to um, meet this criteria, you have to have a human systems integration approach. And it all has to work for the guys in the field, the people that have the wrenches in their hands, regardless of who they work for, the people that supervise those individuals, all the way back to the, in the as from an offshore perspective, the beach, where at some point it rolls up to the operations manager or the executive VP, however that data goes forward, and becomes part of a project. And they also need to have the tools to do it, as you see, uh, the mobility devices that are becoming common in today's environment. So this system that we've built, the ORS 360, is built this way. That on top of that, there's an automatic audit process. Every time you hit submit, you've got a timestamp. Uh, and what we've seen with customers, both from a standpoint of the suppliers as well as the operators, they both like it. The operator gets a timestamp that the work's done. The engineering company gets a timestamp that confirms that the work's done. And there's less argument about it in some cases. And built around standards, uh, ISO, uh, API, whatever standards are appropriate for this for a particular job. So we talk a little bit about how operational excellence is becoming a focus. There's a lot of pressure on management and technical staff. There's been a lot of layoffs, uh, loss of key industry knowledge. I'm going to come back to that in a, in a second. Mergers and acquisitions. If you merge two companies together with two different cultures and two different approaches to operations, even if they're direct competitors, uh, you're going to have some problems with attaining and sustaining operational excellence. The, certainly the crude price decline has resulted in a lot of turmoil in the industry. My personal opinion is I wouldn't expect to see that uh, go back up anytime soon. I think the $50 oil range is probably about where we're going to be, and part of that's being driven by the technology uh, and the ability of, of not just IT, but technologies in general, such as horizontal drilling, to effectively do more with less. And finally, I have been in meetings where the federal government has, has reminded people that just because the price of oil has fallen precipitously, there's no relief from the regulatory requirements, and there's certainly no relief from safety for, for anybody at any time. Now, depending on who you're talking to, there's 3,500 to 5,000 companies in the offshore, the global offshore space. So some number of thousands of companies are all impacted by this. So the, these critical issues that we addressed, that we have today, 
I don't think are going to go away anytime soon. In fact, in some cases, it could get more difficult. A couple of key thoughts. There is an emerging trend that we're talking about some today around operations management systems. Uh, likewise, uh, some of the regulations such as the um, American Petroleum Institute recommended practices number 75, which is all about offshore operations. There's an update coming that work groups in place right now. Uh, one of the chapters that will be uh, new is contractor management, which we've talked some about and we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, as well as cybersecurity. Uh, critical systems depend on information technology, remote, remote management communications today, and are very exposed. Technology continues, particularly water management. I don't see mergers and acquisitions abating. But last year, there was investment in big data to the tune of over $115 million by 20 different uh, venture capitalist deals. So there is investment being made. Uh, I'm a belief if the doors are open and you've got a company working, then there's value to be extracted from that organization. If the doors are shuttered, that's a different story. Uh, there is an effort, this little quote on the bottom, to transition the landman's function. I met Reed a couple years ago, uh, and he's in the process of trying to take something that's a very manual uh, process of capturing all the data for the different uh, uh, assets and bids uh, <clears throat> and putting it online. So it's kind of like the um, the way that you do your houses, your, your um, yeah, you know, brain freeze, but you know, the, the chain of custody on that house is well known. You know who the owners are, you know if there's any claims on it. He's trying to do the same thing there. So I think what we'll see is continuous investment in technology to help drive down the cost of operations and make it more efficient. So I'm going to talk a little bit about enabling technology. Um, clearly, we have a commercial product, uh, and so that's what I'm most familiar with. There are some out there that do some of what we do. Uh, we are of the opinion that we're fairly unique, but every every organization feels that way. So we spun out ORS 360 uh, in 2015. It's an operations management system. We initially enabled it with the SIMS regulations. Now we did this because we worked with one of the super independents who uh, worked with us and, and showed us how their well construction interface document goes into how they do it, and we put that into the system. It's built around a culture of safety mentality, and clearly it's a cloud mobility device. As you see, it is available as an app as well as a, a back office system and desktop. We've been working on this for a long time. This is at least the third generation. I mentioned that we um, had a checklist approach a couple of years ago, in fact, a little bit longer than that, that didn't work very well. So we've made some mistakes getting here. Uh, I think we've learned from them. And we know what customers don't want. And this product has been out now for about 18 months. And we know a lot about what they like about it and where they've asked us to enhance it. We have that underway. So if you look at the challenges in this graphic I showed you before uh, around operational agility and resiliency, you've got safety. And 90, again, 90% 90 of the contractors are 9% of the personnel are contractors. In 2008 to 2012, there's 545 oil field deaths. That's a lot. Um, and it's really not something we should be real proud of and certainly something should be worked on. The number of violations, thousands of violations resulting in fines, shutdowns, the like, impact on the bottom line for sure. Risk mitigation. I think this number of 200 million is pretty low. Um, I think the impact on... Um, the organizations from failures in field operations can be quite high, non-productive time, equipment lost, personnel lost, et cetera. And we certainly got to drive down um, engineering processes and make them more effective. And there's a number of studies out, the two of which I'm referencing here today, to talk about the value and how to do it. So how is operations done today? You got a system, as we said, we've got employees and contractors. The employees are behind an IT firewall, and they can take full advantage of the ERP systems, asset management systems, maintenance systems, whatever. Uh, the contractors don't. And while some of your premier contractors may have some access, uh, you, it's correct that they're outside the firewall because they are doing a different job and don't have access to the same information. And certainly, 
in this ERP system with your core financials uh, for publicly traded companies, that's very valuable and insider information needs to be protected. So rightfully so, they're outside the firewall. Spreadsheets are still used extensively, uh, have been, and every evidence is that they continue to be. And you can't manage spreadsheets. You can't manage them internally, and you certainly can't manage them externally. So the end result with uh, field data in silos, a lot of manual reporting, limited actual information, and lack of visibility in any kind of meaningful real time. I know of one large oil company who, for their operations management system, has four different software packages, none of which communicate with each other. So this problem is not just with smaller companies, it is with the larger ones as well, but you can imagine that in today's environment, your subcontractors and their subcontractors are really struggling to manage these processes in a cost-effective way. So the value proposition that we believe ORS brings to the party is that we bridge that gap. We interface back with the, the, the tools. We take information from them for the project. When the project is finished, it's it posted back through the firewall to where asset management systems, the ERP, wherever it needs to go. Uh, but in the meantime, you've got field operations. And it's very similar in the old days. Uh, many of you may recall when you would send drawings to your contractors so they could do their work by DHL. Uh, now we send drawings through the drawing management system, but the, sa but the same issue applies. Your contractors have got to have access to key information to do their job, and once their job is finished, they need to post that data back. And as I mentioned, an audit history, what we've seen is customers really like that because it enables that to take place automatically and reports can automatically be built from that. So we end up with actionable information, improved operational efficiency, and as I mentioned, we build compliance into the workflow. We work with our customers to do it. Um, so they, once their operations management system has been built into this uh, and you do the job accordingly, according to the system, you, in fact, are in compliance with the regulations and we believe enhances the safety of, of, of person, field personnel. And the 360 comes out of uh, looking at a perspective from a more comprehensive view of operations. So what I'd like to do now is shift gears uh, and give you a short demonstration. Uh, this will be a very high level because I know your time is valuable. And if there's further questions on that, we can certainly discuss it, off, discuss it offline. So this is our, our ORS 360 site. Uh, you'll see we've got a dashboard where you can um, see the various status on key metrics and things going on. And what you're looking at is a demo site, so there's very little in here. Uh, in terms of policies, we put the policy in here once. For example, this bridging document actually was a sanitized version. It was provided to us from uh, one of the operators. So that is the way that they bridge the, the work between themselves and all thousands of their uh, subcontractors or contractors. Projects are identified, uh, and we'll skip over here to job procedures. So in this case of job procedure, which you start to get, as you recall during that little drawing I had, we went from big processes down to subtasks. As we go through this, these are identified. And you'll see here, there's a lot of information that can be added into it. And down here, where we've got a series of activities, you see in, in this case, this activity is finished. So as it's done, you get a timestamp when it's, it's finished, so the automatic audit is taken care of. The other thing we do um, is we, sorry, let me go backwards here. You'll see these other uh, tests were put together. Once you put the policies and procedures in there and you load up another example and say we're going to do a, another blowout preventer repair, all these policies and procedures come with it. So you see they're automatically in here, and I'll show you how we build the workflows in just a second. But once you've got the workflow and the policies and procedures and the documents in there, it's a one-time input. And then every time that particular type of process is initiated, this these standard operating procedures are populated. 
And as you say, as we said, if you go through this process, you'll see that it's all been recorded. So let me go over here to um, I'm the administrator, so I can go in here and I can look at the, the different users, which are the individuals that you'd expect to have. And it's typically driven by um, uh, e um, email address. But let me skip to the roles. As you see, we have constructed an organization starting all the way with the chief executive officer for the oil company and then for the energy services companies as well. So each of these roles drives um, the type of uh, in involvement that that individual is going to have with this system. The CEO, for example, may have no, inf no involvement with it, but in a smaller company, he may be involved. A set of policy pro profiles, rather, are put together. So for risk management, we've got a number of ways that we set this up. So this way, the, the contacts, the, the way the data can be seen, et cetera, um, each can be uniquely put together. Groups can be identified, so individuals can participate in those groups and uh, the roles of the folks that are in there, et cetera. Uh, and so we've got a lot of uh, capability in terms of putting the system together. I want to skip down here to the workflows. Sorry, I hit the wrong one. Web. You'll see we've got a number of workflows, everything from an email uh, to the actual blowout work, out, uh, work itself. And you'll see that we've input a number of tasks. And inside each of these tasks, oops, that one's empty. Inside each of these tasks, and I think, I think some of these are populated. Oop, I guess not. I picked the wrong blow up preventer. Inside each of these tasks are the steps that you saw in that um, job function back here. These steps. Now you see that there's a document associated with this. This is actually uh, the user's manual for a, for a particular blow up preventer. Again, that data is put into the system once through documents, and we can capture the different types of, and you saw the, the bridging document earlier as part of the policy. All these are captured once, and as a change, you can update it, and if you have, say, a version 1.1 comes out of this, you can retain the old version for those projects that it was associated with and use the new, new version for the projects that it's associated with. Um, a number of products, for example, uh, in this case, an FPSO is a piece of equipment, when you put a serial number on it, it becomes an asset. So if you're a service company or a marine company, you can capture your assets this way. We also have the ability to generate automatic barcodes uh, so that we can then read the piece of equipment with the smartphone and it tracks immediately back to the asset that's listed in ORS. Uh, Number of other issues we can put in the different organizations. Uh, in this case, we've got my company, but if you've got, uh, say, the service companies and engineering companies and product companies, you can do all that. So I wanted to give you just a brief overview. The real focus here for this is to get these different job processes done and make sure that all of the information associated with doing that is available to the individual with the wrench standing there on the facility, his supervisor, uh, and then when it's finished, it is he documents that I have finished it by hitting the submit button, and it's automatically audited. The um, we can set this up so that a senior person can just say, "Look, I'll take all ten steps, and I trust you that you can do them, that you did it." Or a more junior person might you might want them to go through each step, and that can be configured by the user. So let me go back. and talk about how do we get all this. Now, if we, there's been a lot of discussion around change management for a very long time. 
I've been involved in it either as a a receiver of change management. I was going to say victim, but uh, some of the early days I felt that way. Uh, but more recently, we've done a lot of change management uh, with our clients, right? organizational transformation type of things. So the argument goes, people resist change. We hear that all the time. I don't want to change. Uh, we'll just wait and see what happens when we go back. Once the guys leave, we'll go back where we we'll be doing it. Uh, I think most of you don't even know what that black phone is. Um, I've been using this slide for a while, and I went, actually went out and bought one of these phones to take to when I do these things in person. I forgot how big and heavy they were. But we all have moved towards these uh, smarter telephones uh, for a lot of reasons. It's a lot more um, useful. Uh, we're not tied to a wall with a cord. Um, many of you may know that Lotus 123 was the the application, the so-called killer app that launched the PCs in the 80s because the accountants uh, could use their to do their the work. Um, this Lotus 123 has been supplanted by um, Excel, I guess. I think it's still out there, and I believe IBM owns it, but I'm not sure. Other things change. The social mores change, uh, at least in the States, and I think pretty much everywhere these days. Drinking and driving is not acceptable anymore. Used to be, I'm here in Texas, you could go into the 7-Eleven, buy a can of beer, and they would put it in a little brown bag, and people would drink their beers on the way home, and I'm sure no one knew what was going on, because we all had them. Um, so there's penalties associated with that now. In terms of the seat belts, uh, more of a carrot, because if you are in an accident, the seat belt very likely could save your life or prevent injury. So people do change uh, a carrot and a stick. Uh, the carrot is in the phones. Uh, the stick perhaps is in the, um, the, the alcohol and operating heavy equipment, not anymore. Uh, so people do change, but they change when they're given a reason. And I think that the the argument that people don't change uh, is a fallacious one because I've seen people into their 70s and 80s that have made transitions to using technology such as PCs and smartphones and, and the like when certainly, uh, and this was several years ago, uh, and certainly they weren't raised with the technology, but once they found out how to, to use it and the value that it got, such as getting pictures from grandchildren, uh, they used it. So in terms of change management, there's really a pretty well-defined process. And I'm going to skip down to bullet number three. You can't change me, but it is all about me. If you make my job better, if you make my job safer, if you give me uh, an incentive to be behave in this manner because it makes my life better or less painful uh, in some cases, I I'm going to respond to it. If you come in and say, okay, the organization is going to change and it's all going to be good, trust me, uh, that approach doesn't get you very well. But it's a three-step process. You've got to go through the initial process. You've got to get your act together, staged. Uh, a large organization is probably not going to go through a change management process in a week. It's going to go through a, very, a number of steps. And then you've got to continue to apply energy to it to sustain it. Um, part of what we're really doing here, if you think about it, is it's all cross-cultural negotiations. If you're negotiating between a U.S. operator and a Middle East engineering company or a, a Southeast Asian product supplier, all of those have different cultures, and not just the culture of being in one country or one ethnicity, but there's a definite cultural difference between an operator and an energy services company. Uh, we've addressed this in other, other areas, and we won't talk about it today, but recognizing that we're dealing with a number of cultures uh, when we're changing is important because everybody takes information in different ways. Managing the resistance. There will be some people that will cross their arms and say, no, I'm not changing. You can't make me do it, blah, blah, blah. In some cases, those individuals need to leave. Um, this book that you see, the late Dutch Holland uh, colleague of mine, um, and I authored this book, it was published in 2014, uh, and he's an expert in change management. He's, he had done it for his whole career. Uh, and part of the reason that that book is written as opposed to a generic 
um, change management book is back to bullet number three. If I'm on an offshore platform, I want to see how it works for me, not how the, the Navy does it or not the nuclear power industry does it or even the guys in the refinery do it. I want it to be relevant to me. And I'm a firm believer that if you make it all about me, my value, uh, make my life better or make my life less or worse in some case, it's, um, that's where you're going to see the change uh, adapted. So moving towards this, this is, like I said, it's an iterative process. We're, we're here where we are doing business the way we're doing it. Uh, we're going to go through an iterative process through a number of changes. Uh, pilots, after you've generated awareness and education, and then the widespread integration. And the energy has to remain applied. You can't just say, okay, we've got changed and we're done, uh, so we don't have to do it anymore. Uh, that's the old way of doing it. The consultants show up, they do the change management, and then they take off. That doesn't work. Um, people fall back to the old ways of doing it. I know it's not physically correct, but I, I like to, as my bachelor degree is in physics, and I like to use the example, if you apply energy to an electron, it's going to jump to a higher orbit than the atom. As soon as you take that energy away, it's going to come back to its, its stable state. You've got to continue to apply that energy. Now, there's a lot of information available, and I just uh, made a statement about it's all about me and it's got to look like me. There is external um, good practices available from a wide range of subjects. The, a lot of the safety culture uh, that we're seeing right now has its roots in the nuclear power industry and Three Mile Island. The uh, culture of safety concept came out of that. So while there's differences in that, and I was actually in Vienna last year uh, at the Atomic Energy Agency talking about safety cultures and comparing what we were doing in the oil and gas with what the nuclear is doing. There's a lot of good data in places like that. It does have to be tailored to meet the need of the organization that you're in and the sector that you're in. There's a lot of uh, good inside industry data as well that people have done. But also, a large super major and a super independent and an independent and an engineering company are not the same. And the processes and procedures that work in one may not work in another. So you've got to be cognizant of that. The other thing that you need to do as part of this change management process is train your people. Uh, we're, we're seeing issues like right now, right now where it's very difficult to, uh, to spend the money on training. There's a lot of concern that the knowledge is leaving the industry and there's no way to capture it. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But you really have to make sure that your workforce is competent uh, and again, back to this right to get the job or, or uh, permit to operate. Uh, if you don't meet certain training standards these days, you're not going to be hired. So you've got to have all that. It's got to be a commitment. You've got to demonstrate it. So this whole process of changing towards one of safety and operational excellence requires a great deal of energy. Uh, and as I argued earlier, the risk of not doing it are greater than the risk of doing it. So this is the new way that we do business. So some final thoughts. Um, not going to operational excellence is not an option. Uh, I think that's worded incorrectly. You have to do it these days, but you've got to know what operational excellence is and what it means to your organization. I believe we can document shareholder value. Uh, there's also no reason not to. Uh, there's best practices available. There's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of knowledge. Um, the two papers that I, three papers that I cited, uh, I think in those three papers alone, there's a lot of information. And the technology enablers are there. We've looked at one. We are working with a, um, an independent operator right now to take our economic value proposition matrix model, and many of you may be familiar with that, and document it, uh, use it to put a financial perspective on the value of operational excellence. Once that's available, We'll probably have another webinar. I hope to have it done by the end of November. Uh, we'll have another webinar, and at the very least, I'll send you links to a website. One of the things that we've been doing, and I know there are a couple of you on the, on the call today, is we started working with a group of very senior drilling engineers, in some cases retired. And this relatively small group of individuals, I think it's something less than 10, um, have a tremendous amount of knowledge. And in discussions with them, uh, we're in the process 
of taking that knowledge, we're going to put it into our ORS 360 platform. But once it's the knowledge is in the form of a workflow, then it is something people can actually use. One of the challenges that I've seen with knowledge management is we tend to think of it from a standpoint of information technology and that there is a lot of um, IT components to it and it becomes more of a database and then in some cases you can't find stuff. Uh, but getting that knowledge out in the form that someone can actually use it has been a tough deal. Um, in fact, yesterday I was on a conference call with um, one of the leading experts in human factors who's up in Ohio uh, and she's involved in aerospace. In fact, she's doing a project right now uh, for the medical community looking at how they use human factors in that process, which is of interest to all of us. And um, she's agreed to work with us to start to take some of the work processes that she's developed over her career and put them into um, ORS 360. So it seems to me, and we're just beginning to touch on this, that taking the knowledge that the or that organization and individuals in particular have uh, as they're leaving the workforce and the big concern about the big crew change is the brain drain and all that expertise and experience leaving is to capture that in the form of a workflow that then can be used in a tool such as our our ORS 360 that enable people that don't have the ex the experience to capture our lean on the value of those that do. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure how successful we will be with this at this point. We're just starting it, but it has a lot, of, uh, a lot of reasons to believe that this is a pretty good way to use some of these tools so that um, operation, operational excellence uh, can become part of the equation in a lot of different companies. So this, this is basically what I had to say today. In terms of the references cited, uh, these are all linked, as you see. The Society of Petroleum Engineering definition of operational excellence, um, you agree or disagree, but one of the things that we really have to do is define it. If we don't know what we're trying to get to, we can't do it. The Bain report uh, is a pretty good one, and there's a lot of information in there if you're so inclined. There are two McKinsey papers, um, one's on operational excellence, and it's uh, a little bit older, but the points that they make are still very relevant. And one that was released in 2015 is a McKinsey paper, and that's where the numbers of the value of, um, of that can be realized by managing offshore projects more effectively. Finally, we've done a lot of work in this area. Those of you that know me know that I've published a fair number of books. They are all of them available on Amazon, I believe. We publish a bi-weekly um, blog with Penn Energy on governing energy where, where we cover examples like this. There's a number, number of monographs and other information out there uh, and links to the web, the data on the, on the website. Um, so this is an area where we've spent a fair amount of time in over the years and um, you think it's um, obviously right now, as, as I said, if you Google operational excellence, you will come up with a very large number of hits. But as I looked at it, I said, and part of the reason for putting this webinar together was, okay, what is it and how do I get one? So here's my contact information. Um, you will get a, a, a copy of this deck as well as the uh, access to the, the recorded version. And uh, thank you for your time. We've got a few minutes for questions if there are any. And you can type them into the box below. One of the things that, um, that I think is going to be real important is the smaller companies, and I'm, by small I mean even very very tiny companies. There's one organization that I'm familiar with that has eight, uh, eight PhDs in it, and they do work on ocean currents. And they are required to meet the regulatory requirements as well. Uh, so that's a very small company that's not going to be able to spend a lot of money on big IT systems. So, you know, systems that facilitate that, I think, are, are going to be in vogue, and that's where they were headed, I believe, with the tablet and mobility-enabled systems. I don't see that we have any more questions, so I do appreciate everybody's time today. Um, and as I said, you have my contact information, and if you have any questions, feel free to holler. And um, again, have a good day, and for those of you in Australia, I appreciate you staying up late. Thank you very much.